This is gonna be rather unique. I know, I know. Crazy. Hi guys, I'm Devin from Devin Talks Tabletop. I'm your friendly neighborhood board gamer and this is a YouTube series in which the games are made up and what I say doesn't matter. Let's jump into this. The reason why I said it's going to be unique is because this is an unboxing and a first impression because I've got a new box here full of goodies from Nemesis Games but I've already played it. I have played this game with Jesse and with Max, which you can go see that over on Quackalope if you haven't already. I know what this game is, so I can talk about it effectively, not just narrate what I'm doing, but I can talk about the game, and then I can also give you a first impressions at the same time. Crazy. This is Uprising, Curse of the Last Emperor. If I'm a judicious editor and scheduler, this could even be out when the campaign is still alive because they have a new ugh, campaign going on, which is the whole reason why we covered it to begin with. Also, I would just cover it on my own now, even without the impetus of having an ongoing campaign because I really enjoyed this. I enjoyed this even though we got destroyed. I enjoyed this even though we got a few rules wrong. I enjoyed this because it was manic, because it was absolutely gorgeous on the table, and because it fixed a few problems that I have with games that might be, it be it could be compared to. So I, I've had two different games that this was compared to. This is Uprising Curse of the Last Emperor, but for, ooh, I don't think I'm gonna do all the punch board. I'm not good at doing punch board for you guys because I think I'm not gonna do punch board. Yes, it contains small parts and could be a choking hazard. That's valid. That's valid for, I think, most board games that, that I have. Anyways, it is a hex-based survival game that is cooperative, even though it seems competitive. It, it, it's it's kind of got some elements to it that make you think it's going to be semi-co-op or just fully competitive, but it really is cooperative because... You've got this board that you build out. You all start as different factions in this world. And then you've got two different enemies that attack you. You have the Chaos Hordes, and then you have the Imperial Legion. And one fights you from the center out, and one fights you from the exterior in. And it's, it's, a, lot of, it's a lot to juggle. Not in a bad way. It's, it's a very interesting like mitigation puzzle where you're trying to determine what can I do here to stay alive and to keep not only me alive, but my the other factions around us. Because your separate factions, you have unique asymmetric abilities or characters that you bring into play. But then on the flip side of that, you only win if all of you, one to four players, if all of you are ahead of both the Chaos Hordes and the Imperial Legion, that's the only way that you win. If one of you is doing really well, but the other ones are suffering, everybody loses. This has been compared, at least in conversations that I've had with Max and Jesse, I think Max compared it to Spirit Island, which I think is fair. And I think Jesse compared it to Pandemic, which I also think is fair. Pandemic is a scenario, I mean, both of them are games in which the, the game is trying to beat you by overloading you with negative consequences. In pandemic, that means that you're having outbreaks of all of the disease cubes while you're trying to go around and heal them or cure them and then also immunize or develop a vaccine against them. So pandemic works in that way and it's a very accessible and entry level or gateway game to the hobby. And then Spirit Island is not a gateway or entry level game. It is a very much more complex and nuanced system in which once again the board is trying to overwhelm you this time though with colonizers and an invasion into a island that you know the demigods or whatever spirits you are are trying to save the land and also save the native people on it the Dahan. That one is a little bit more complex because it's got a progressive engine of you see what's going to happen where at like the, the deck of the enemy, the AI deck that is slowly advancing and spreading across the land, you progressively see where each step is about to hit. You see what's going to build, you see what's going to spread, you see what's going to, you see the, you see the puzzle as it's unfolding 
And so you're able to develop a strategy as you go. Pandemic is much more random. It's like, oh, this pops up here, this pops up here. And occasionally you'll just have a moment. I say that it's random, but you do reshuffle the same deck of stuff that's been happening. So whatever cities have had negative, you know, expulsions or, or growth of disease are much more likely to once again be hit as the deck gets reshuffled whenever you have those epidemic cards get pulled. Both of them function in similar ways. I would say though that Pandemic is a game that really leads its leans towards alpha gaming. It's very easy to quarterback there. Because it's a gateway game, there's a very easy instinct. And this is not me being accusatory of other people. This is really me being self-indicting of how I was when I would teach people the game is it's very much an experience where you can be like, oh, you've never played before, here's this game. Okay, oh, what should you do? Well, you should probably do this, this, this. You should probably do this, this, this. And it's kind of takes a lot of agency away from the people that are learning the game. And it's also just an experience that I, not soured on, but just grew tired of and grew disinterested in how it played. I also played Pandemic Legacy, which I think is the best version of Pandemic. And I think it narratively or interestingly enough does a lot of good things for that game core engine, but I got tired of it. And then Spirit Island is a game that I just have never been compelled by the puzzle of it. It has never been something that has been engaging. And I know I'm doing an unboxing of Uprising Curse of the Last Emperor and I'm talking a lot about both Pandemic and Spirit Island. Bear with me, there's a reason for that because I think this is a great game. And I think that this is a game that I would not tire of for the same reasons that I tire of Spirit Island. And I don't think it's a game that I would phase out of interest for in Pandemic. It is a beautifully produced, lovingly made experience that is just bananas. It is, it's crazy. Like when stuff starts to happen, you get that sense like in Spirit Island when you're like, I don't know how we're going to win this. And then you get that sense in Pandemic where you're like, oh, we really have to work together in order to get past this, like the cooperative aspect is there. But it's just, it's so wonderfully produced. You've got these gorgeous acrylic or plastic standees. They're plastic standees with artwork on them. They snap really heavily into place. They're based off of the different factions. The, the visual feast that you have here with Uprising is really, really nice. It takes, I mean, it's a table hog. It takes up a massive amount of space. If you're using the sideboards that have the quests on them and then have the graveyard for the Chaos Hordes and the Imperial Legion, and you have the main board with all the hexes on it, this is a table hog for sure. But the experience is really cool because you have these uh, expansions here, or you have the main four factions that you've got here, and then you've got really chunky pieces like your score trackers. It is, it's a really visual stunning experience. You've got these score trackers here that are so thick and highly produced. You've got the custom dice here that, you know, despite Jesse's first assumptions, did not go along with the factions that might be of the same color. These are all specific to ranged and melee dice and other, uh, other types of combat that you go into here. You've got all of these cards here that work as both the player decks and the item cards. And then you also have your quest cards here and your legion cards. Everything in this is, there's so many variables, so many variables to take into consideration whenever you're playing. You've got the different hordes or legions that'll pop up, which have their own threat level. They have their own activation uh, problems that you have to deal with. It's, it's a lot of stuff to manage. In, in not a bad way. It's, it's a lot of stuff to manage in a good way because I think what that does is it creates variability over the course of your game. And each game is gonna, to me, feel very, very different. I don't know why I'm doing it from the top. It's got one of these side pools. You would just think that I would have figured that out much sooner than I did. Based off of how many games I opened, you would have thought I would have figured that out. So I'm gonna separate out all of the people's cards here. We'll just put those there. And then I'll put all the items and the other ones. Oh wait, are there more people here? Oh, there really are more people there. That's a lot. Are these all of the people's? 
And those are all the druid ones. Oh, there we go. Okay. There we go. There's all the different peoples. There we go. I got those split up. Just really gorgeous production level from Nemesis Games. I, I was very impressed. This was the kind of this was the kind of experience when you see something so well done, like the production of a game, you're like, oh, well, if, if the production of the game is this good, then maybe the gameplay suffers in some regard. And that that is just that wasn't the case for me. I felt like everything landed really nicely whenever I was playing this. Everything about how this functioned was just really satisfying. And there we go. I, the, the other thing that's crazy to me is I think, you know, Max and uh, Jesse were both talking about how difficult this game is, like how hard it is to win. And I think that, I think that's valid. I think that you can feel that way. You can feel that way about cooperative games like Pandemic and Spirit Island. But I think that this is a this is an experience that I am much more likely to want to engage in even when I haven't done well. Even when I've lost, I'm going to want to come back and try it again. And I think that's unique to games that are difficult. There are plenty of games that are hard that I just don't have a lot of interest in going back to retrying. But some that do it right, I'm very much engaged in and I'm, I'm okay that it's difficult. I felt that way with Bloodborne, not just the video game, but the board game as well. I felt that way with that. What is that? Oh, that's the, that's the tag. That was annoying. That felt weird on my face. That, ow, that itches. That itches. There we go. Yeah, so I felt that way about Bloodborne and I feel that way about Uprising. I just think that this is a really fun, fun experience. You know, for example, you've got, you've just got really cool production elements here that to me, they're in the same space as like Dwellings of Eldervale, where you have stuff that you don't think about that just kind of layers onto itself and really, really comes up with a cool experience. That, oh, this stuff was just, it was just in there differently and better before I messed with it. Well, we're going to put that there, all of that, so that I can just open up this piece here. Oh, there we go. The reason why I wanted to do that is I, I just simply want to show you how satisfying this is to have your haven and then to put walls around your haven. And then after you put walls around your haven to build a tower on it. And it all just nestles into one. That's so satisfying to me. I know that maybe no, maybe you don't care about it, but it's really satisfying. Yeah, this is... So when, when I was up in Ohio last week or whatever, or last week slash weekend, I, ha I played quite a few games. And there were several games that I was like, ooh. This, I'm very glad that I got to play this because this, this tells me something about a game that I not was going to write off, but just didn't know enough about to make an informed decision on. And the two games that I was the happiest about was this and then The Great Wall from Awakened Realms. I, I just was, I really enjoyed this. And I can see why, I think it was, I think they were saying that this was uh, Sean. Uh, Sean, that, you know, Mar Markham, Sean Markham, friends with Jesse and Max. I can see why this is one of his favorite games, because it really is just this experience. And I don't mind at all that it's a tough one that the majority of the time, maybe I'm going to lose. That doesn't really phase me. What, what, what I am excited about is how much it gives me potential to see, okay, this is something that I want to keep exploring and keep seeing, like when I win this game, it's going to feel really satisfying. And that's kind of what I'm looking forward to is that moment when it's like, okay, there we go. I'm going to win. And I, I totally put this in poorly. I'm going to have to fix that later, but I just figured that you didn't want to see me. I figured you didn't want to see me punch out all of that stuff. So that means I'm going to leave it in this awkward too high, which I, really bugs me. But I'm not going to do anything about it right now. And it, that's the base game. And I think there's a lot of content in the base game that you wouldn't even need to justify having more. 
But if you like the puzzle that's there, and once you get to a certain point, I'm assuming that there are strategies and there are ways that you can get to a point of comfort and you're like, oh, I've got this. Like I know the ways in which I know in what the ways in which they're going to function and I can I can get around that. And so this is the Arch Nemesis expansion that comes with it. And we played with this in ours. Now, again, like I said, there were things that we did incorrectly when we played, but I, I don't care because I'm really excited about what's in here. You have additional expansions and these factions just seem to be completely unique in how they approach certain stuff. There's some that don't have havens in here. There's some that have a lot more units because they're like they're animal or beast masters. They're like the herd. So there's factions that players can use in here that give a little bit of versatility based off of what you have in the base game. And then also there's the Arch Nemesis expansion where instead of having a progressive group of bad guys from the Chaos Horde and the Imperial Legion that come after you, you end the game. The final chapter is always the most difficult chapter. You typically double the amount of negative activations that the, that the bad guys are going to have. But in here, instead of having that double activation, you actually introduce this arch nemesis from either the Chaos Horde or the Imperial Legion. And they're like the big bad. It's a, it's a cool narrative ending for each gameplay experience because you have this larger enemy that you have to deal with. And it makes, it, it ramps it up in the, another level to where you have, you know, let's see. I mean, wh who's all here? Uh, you've got the other factions, as I said, but you've got the Draco Lich, which looks like a terrifying undead dragon, which looks like from on the front of the page, that's the Draco Lich. You have the Butcher, which looks like this monstrous gladiatorial enemy. And then you have the Inquisitor, which seems like a terrifying dual sword we wielding you know, martial enemy. And then you have the Empress. And the Empress is the one that we faced. And she was just hardcore. When we faced her, it was like, okay, um, here, just your havens that you've protected over the course of the whole game, I'm going to nuke them from afar. And we couldn't really do anything about it. So a really intense escalation of the experience that already exists this is just another level that you have to deal with and so if you ever get to the point where you're like hey base uprising i've kind of got it handled you can jump into the arch nemesis expansion which is also there and then once you get done with all of that there's the new content that's out so this was uprising curse of the last emperor and the arch nemesis expansion if i am right and i've got my ducks in a row or my hamsters in a row then there is more content out there for you to check out. And this is a this is an experience that I played this in the same weekend that I played Uthia. And I had a lot of people in the comments for Jesse's channel that were asking, what would you pick between Uprising and Uthia? And I, I know that there's a lot of different opinions out there. And there are people that like experiences like Mage Knight and Uthia. For me, my vote is hands down Uprising. I really enjoyed this. And it's a game that I feel like is much easier to table than Uthia. And also it's one that I'd play with other people. I feel like Uthia is a game that if I played it, it would be kind of more of a solo experience. I don't really know if I'd play it with other people. Because I think that the way that, that kicks up the playtime or the runtime of the game. And I don't know if I'm really as interested in that. And this one is definitely, it's the experience that you share with other people around the table. And you're trying to make sure that you compete and survive and you get past the, the horde and the legion. And it's much more of an engaging and entertaining experience for me. And so out of those two, I, I pick this one. I pick Uprising. And I, I mean, I, I enjoyed it so much, I reached out and was like, hey, I want to get my hands on this. I want to try to play it some more. I want to get some content out there. So Uprising for me was was a good success. I liked a lot about it. I do think that the only thing that might be uh, a, a criticism or some, maybe something to watch out for is the feeling of randomness that could occur based off of whatever dice rolls you have or whatever monsters seem to come out, if their activations chain with other ones, and if the events or the quests seem particularly punishing or non-synergizing. It, it could be a debilitating like, oh man, it's like, it's so hard to come against this. But I feel like when you play this game more and more, you'll get to the point where you have the strategies in mind where you're like, oh, this happened. We can mitigate that or adapt to that based off of X, Y, Z. 
So I really enjoyed Uprising and I'm excited to jump into it again and see if I can win at some point. So I hope you guys had a good one and I'm gonna move on to the next video. So see you guys next time. Timestamp.